Okay, so super excited to have our guest speakers here. We have Matt Weaver and me from IDF, IDFL, sorry. Um, and they're going to talk to you about a lot of testing things um, that specifically have a lot of stuff to do with any filling that goes in product, right? With a focus on gown. Um, you guys have done a little bit of your own research on their website. And so pull those questions out. And as they're going through their presentation, feel free to ask mm -hmm. questions because that's what they're here for. Um, so, yeah, I'll just let you guys see that. Um, before you were asked to look, research IDFL, have any of you heard of IDFL before? Yeah. Yeah. Besides, yes. Besides, <laughs> um, So as I ever said, we specialize in field textile products and all the testing and quality assurance that is required for that. Whether it's the textiles, whether you're putting down feathers, wool, camel hair, polyester, anything like that. Um, we're looking at the whole big picture and does it meet client specifications? And uh, that we're going to touch on client specs and then the legal requirement also for a specific product. And so we're going to go through a lot of products. Uh, we want to start with a video. Um, after that video, it's a six minute video, just kind of introducing down testing. This is better than anything we need and I can present. And then uh, after that, we'll introduce IDFL a little more. Uh, we've got a few things we're going to go over. Uh, we're going to focus heavily on testing variants. And for those that are really interested in product testing, this is a huge thing when it comes to any textile product. It is false positive or false negative when it comes to single test, uh, um, which happens all the time, particularly on the supplier level. Who's, trying to sell their product and they're relying on a single test report and tell their buyer this is a good product you think we should buy or um, our lot. So, so we'll, we'll touch into that. We'll focus on supply chain. Um, MIG, MIG is our North America global audit uh, uh, manager and she focuses on all the brands that are producing globally and she audits their uh, facilities here. And of course, in Canada and in the U.S., there are some down feather production for the meat industry. So we can touch in on that a little bit. So if there's any questions, jump in, interrupt us. Let's start with the video and then get into some detail. You can spend a lot of time talking about why I think down is great. Birds use it. They've been using it for millions of years. The insulation value and warmth it can provide based on the weight ratio cannot be reproduced in any other film material. It needs a little bit of body heat and some moisture. The down will open up and that's a natural occurring beautiful phenomenon that provides the loft, the insulation, and all those things. My name is Matt Lieber, Sorry, I'm the CEO sure. for International Down Laboratories <laughs> in Salt Lake and in Europe. We're a third generation family company. My grandfather founded it 40 years ago, and we have been focusing on this niche market of fill textiles. Down feathers is a very interesting product because the end consumer, they never see it and they never physically touch the down feathers. Yet they're paying a premium for their product. Every lot that's produced, there are some variations. This means it's vital to have a regular testing program. We at IDFL test everything that has to do with filled textile products. We test for every standard, so it would have to be in the hundreds of tests that we perform in-house. So there's four metrics that I look at. One is you have fill power, measuring the loft. You have down cluster percentage, differentiating between different down products. And then you have species. 
is a goose or duck. And then recently we have DWR. Composition is everything when we're talking about down and feathers. We wish there was a fancy machine that you could test the composition. The composition test has been around for a long time. It requires two things, experience and a lot of patience. The testers that do this may spend an hour or up to five, six, seven hours separating one two gram sample. And the only way to test this is by hand. And you're separating each component into little beakers. And we're identifying all of the different components that are within the down feather plumage. And then it's by weight to evaluate the percentages. Down clusters, feathers, down fibers, feather fibers, residue. The higher the down cluster, the less other unwanted components are in the plumage. If we would then want to see, is this goose or duck? We then have to move with the material to a microfiche, magnify the down cluster, and we then can identify very easily if it's goose or duck. We care if it's goose down or duck down if you're wanting to have loft. And on average, the goose is a larger bird, which means you're gonna have larger down clusters. And if you have a larger down cluster, then you're gonna have a higher loft, which provides the warmth and protection that you seek for outdoor. The reason the higher fill power rating is better, you can make a really warm product with a lower fill power. But if you introduce that 850 fill down into a product, you're gonna produce a lightweight product. The tech, when it receives a sample, it will empty it into a fill power box. So the technician will steam the material on all four sides until it's completely saturated. Then this technician will take a dryer and blow dry it until it's completely dry. This allows the down to return to its original state. We take it to the testing room. We then take 30 grams by hand and we place it into a cylinder. The cylinder is a set size that's used all over the world for fill power testing. Once the 30 grams have been placed, we take a plate that's a specific weight and with a rod and we let it drop, sink naturally until it stops. And once it stops, then we can measure the volume, which then can be calculated to the loft. If you're on the field and the down gets wet and really saturated, then you lose your warmth, you lose your loft. And that could be catastrophic depending on the situation you're in. The DWR will extend the time in which uh, down would become saturated. DWR can be added on the down to provide another barrier of safety. That's something to seriously look at when looking at a down jacket to purchase. For the hydrophobic shape test, what we're testing for is how much time elapses before the down becomes saturated. So the basic steps are, take some down, we place it in a jar, we add some water, we then set it on a shaker, and it shakes. We're then stopping it at intervals to evaluate how far along it is and what rating it should be given. A level five would be there's really no saturation and the down is still retaining its loft and warmth capabilities. Once it gets to a level one, that means it's really fully saturated and completely wet. We've got 150 people working at IDFL worldwide, and they all have found that down feathers, even though it sounds boring, is actually pretty exciting. It's a small worldwide industry, and there's a lot of unique uh, opportunities within the down feather industry. It's a product that's naturally produced. It's a great product to work with and to test. First, let me tell you what not to do. Don't go based on, is it puffy or not? That's the worst way to go about checking for a down jacket. My recommendation is check the label, see what the claims are. Does it give you the information you want um, and what you're looking for? Whether it's fill power, down cluster, goose or duck. Educate yourself a little bit about what these basic factors mean. They can be the difference between being warm or cold in whatever 
uh, activity you're doing uh, outdoors. So that basically covers all of down feather testing and so Q, you paid you guys to make that video? We we worked uh, we made that with them. Okay. They came down to Salt Lake and they were interested in showing what their down goes through and testing. So so, so they came down and that was a that was a good project for us, you know, so we're happy with it. So it's hard to show down feather testing and they did a great job. So um let's since we don't have a lot of time, we want to make sure we cover uh, all of these points. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time about just down in general um, because it's such a unique product and uh, in the companies that you probably are interested in or looking at, uh, they all carry a line of down jackets um, in the outdoor industry, down sleeping bags, and in the bedding industry, it's even more prevalent. Every you know company has down feather products in it. Uh, so, how many of you all own a down feather product? Okay. Um, so let's go to down intro. What we're doing that I'm going to I'm going to be passing these jackets around and just take a look at them. I'd be interested in your all's opinion. Just initial reaction. Which one is the best quality? Okay, look at the labels, look at the brands, maybe just take one, spend a few minutes and start getting a feel for these different jackets that all have down in them, all different brands. Some brands you may recognize, some you don't. If there's a brand you don't recognize, um, I'd be curious to know which one you don't recognize. So while you're looking at that, I'm gonna spend a little time talking about down. So, gram for gram, it's the world's best insulation. Have you all ever heard of promotions or anything of companies saying we have equivalent down or down equivalent product? Have you seen that claim no. on products? So, uh, um, a long time ago, maybe 30 years ago, uh, the US government wanted to make a down equivalent uh, product. And they had come, come up very close, a really nice product, and ended up being a company called Primal. Really great uh, synthetic product, but it never could fully achieve the characteristics and properties of down. Um, but they came up with a very good product. So, uh, it's now in the US, it's forbidden to claim that you have a down equivalent product because uh, there's no other product that's been able to achieve gram for gram the same insulation. So that's, that's, that's a lot of companies, they try to go away from down for other reasons, maybe because of uh, animal, animal rights pressure or anything like that. But then they keep coming back to it because the consumer will dictate what you buy. And the consumer says it's not the same. So gram for gram, it's the best for bedding, apparel, sleeping bags. Okay. Who uses it? Everyone. And what's interesting is birds use it. In freezing wet conditions or warm tropical conditions, you will find down everywhere, all over the world. It doesn't matter what climate. And there's a, re there's a reason for that. Okay. Um, what's important for product development producing products is it's natural, sustainable, and renewable, okay? Down, you can take down from, you know, products 30 years old, reprocess it, and it'll be just like new. Um, the polyesters and synthetics will break down after time. They're still good, recycled, but at some point, it can no longer be reprocessed, okay? Uh, here's an example of one we tested it a down sleeping bag from 1929. Uh, we tested that maybe 15 years ago. It was, you know, it was like brand new. You'd have no idea. The material, the fabric was throwaway, but the down itself was fantastic. Okay. Military jet fighters, they use down 
down the sleeping bags because you can vacuum pack them, put them underneath the, the seat. And uh, those are hardly ever used, but the quality, once you take them out and test them, is like it's brand new. So we see, so it's very resilient. Okay. Let's see. Performance of down, all of these things, reduce flammability risk. This is huge for testing, for labeling. Down mattress toppers, for example, are the only product for bedding that's exempt for flammability testing in California. In California, it's huge for requirements for fire uh, testing. And uh, down products are exempt from that. Reduced allergens. Who's who's allergic to down? Question. Anyone feel it? Anyone been told they're allergic to down? Or has anyone been heard that down causes allergies? Has anyone heard that? That's good. That's good. Most people, most clients and stuff we talk to, they say, I'm allergic to down, or down increases my chance of allergens. It's actually the opposite. Um, allergens come from uh, mites that get in, they get into the fabric, right? So all of these down jackets, they have mites. That's for sure, all the bedding do. Um, but why is there actually a reduction in allergens? Why do you think, from a fabric standpoint, why do you think there's a reduction in allergens versus a synthetic or polyester jacket or a polyester pillow? What do you think? Any ideas? Why would there be a reduced dust or mites inside the product? The, the weave of the, the tightness of the weave. So in order to create a down jacket, and we'll touch this, that does not leak all these small fibers coming out, you have to have a much tighter weave on the fabric. Polyester doesn't have all these loose fibers, so you can go much looser on the weave and not have the leakage. So this is a, this is a huge thing because when they then test for allergens, down and feather products have much less allergens inside of the product. And mites is the number of common cause of allergens. And you're saying with mites go into polyester fabrics mm -hmm. more readily after use of the garment? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if you have a, so the testing is post production. So, you, well, they have to test it before because they have to make sure there's no leakage oh, right. of just the fill material. Yeah. That's what they want to avoid. And by by trying to avoid having leakage, it prevents the dust and everything from getting in. Yeah. So factors, we touched on this in the video, content percentage, species, fill power, and we'll touch on that more. So. The main thing with down testing is there are thousands and thousands of decisions that are being made in every test. So let's go to the next one. So this is what we're looking for and we're trying to distinguish and we're trying to find, what are we trying to find? The down cluster. So I'm gonna pass this one down. There's, this, is a, this is basically us taking four grams out of the jacket and separating all the components. So this is that video you saw of the lady pulling everything apart. This is the end result of that test. So if you can look through, find the down cluster, what you think is a down cluster, um, maybe you two that have it, the components, try and find the down cluster. And that's the value. Everything else is just fill. It's, uh, there's no value in it. Right? If you're buying down, you're buying, paying for one thing, you're paying for down cluster, okay? And that's the down cluster right there. That's what that's what you're looking for. Are you able to farm uh, control the health or the strength of that down cluster by what we feed our goose and duck? Um, no, but the bigger the part, the larger the cluster, the stronger the cluster. So, um, and so that's why in general goose goose is a larger or is a larger bird. So you're going to have a much nicer down cluster. So they don't they don't specifically target I'm gonna make it better down because it's all the meat industry controls all of that. Um, so the meat says I want a larger larger bird for meat, the the you know the byproduct of that is a much nicer down product. Companies are also like advertising that they uh, 
basically are sustainably sourcing down or uh, not sustainable? What's the term? Like ethically, ethically sourcing yeah. down. So how do they do? How do they source down? Do they plug? We'll we'll show you. Uh, we'll show you. So yeah. Uh, what would be the benefit of a uh, down? Um, equal benefit. The only difference is. So uh, Goose end with a larger cluster? Yeah, just because it's a larger bird. Is it less expensive for duck down? Yeah. Well, duck down is less expensive. But you can get fantastic duck down and not so good goose down. So if you have a good large duck and a small goose. But it's all dependent on the meat industry. So the duck are slaughtered for the meat industry between four and six weeks old. That's how young they are when they get into the meat supply chain, right? Does your company keep historical records of the down you've had since your grandfather was in um, business? We have all the testing records, you know, what's been tested, yeah. Has there been any trends you guys have noticed um, at all? From like, uh, you know, the- The, the, the clusters are getting smaller because the demand for meat oh. is more so they are slaughtered at a younger age. Yeah. And there's new ways to cheat, yeah. so. For you know, but that's the main that's the main thing. Just the birds are getting smaller based on meat demand. So, so but this is what you're looking at. These things, goose and duck. Um, your question uh, that you had about the difference between duck and goose, and these little these little nodes. That's what creates the down so that they stick together, right? So when the down is in the jacket, you know, they're sticking together and they're creating a pocket of air. And that pocket of air then gets warm, right? And so the goose has many more nodes. They're not as big, but they across the entire line. The duck just has three at the top, right? So the, the goose has much more opportunity to attach and to create that pocket of air. And that's where you're gonna get your warmth, okay? Fill power, any of you that have a down jacket, have you looked at fill power? That's probably the number one uh, consumer test, uh, you know, requirement that they notice is, is it an 800 fill power, 700 fill power, right? Um, and that's, in the US, that's, they've marketed that so well. In Europe and in Asia, it's not so, much of a consumer requirement. But now we've, we've educated the consumers here in the US that the higher the fill power, the better the product. Which is this, this isn't necessarily the case, but that's what how the consumers have been educated over 30 plus years. I've read an article in the past that says that anything over 850 can't, or it's, it's argued that 850 is the highest quality of DACA that you can go up to 1,000 though? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And higher than 1,000? A thousand's pushing it, but we test a thousand regularly. So which companies are carrying a thousand? So there's um, some US based, there's some European based. Are those for, for um, non outdoor people? Oh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, yeah. No one no one put, put high end down in the bedding products. Okay. So it's all anything above 850 is going into outdoor. Cool. So, yeah. um, but this is, this is why people market it. This is all 30 grams, and you can see the loft difference, right? So I can create a much lighter product you know, for my down jacket. So I guess that's the okay. So and the yeah. variance between each of those, uh, I know it's, they're all the same weight, the loft, was that the style of bird that's making them different or where they source the feather from the bird? Oh no, it's, it's, a, it's, um, it's a probably a mixture of both. So, but this is one way you can distinguish qualities. So if you have two different fill materials, you're gonna say, you're gonna test the fill power and say, yeah, this one. How many factories are producing 800 fill down? Or is it like that? Does one factory produce okay. all variants of down? They all vary, or all variations. You can stay in business if you're just producing 800 fill power. Okay. There's not enough quantity. How many company, or how many sort of producers of down are there in North America? In North America, 30, 30, but worldwide there's hundreds, hundreds, so, yeah. and they all, you know, they all intersect, so now, so. 
But this is, for example, the difference between the different other fill materials, thinsulate, poly down, poly guard, all these different other things, and why it down just creates a bigger loft. Okay? So, let's see. Testing. This is the biggest challenge is, and you see this even when you're just testing fabric. I saw you have a good piece of fabric right here. Right? So if we, if we take this piece of fabric, we cut it in half, and you have you test one and you test the other, you're gonna have different results. Maybe not as big as a variation as when testing down a feather, but you're always gonna have a variation. So that's why sampling is so important particularly for finished products, okay? And we're gonna uh, talk, uh, touch that when we play uh, Skittle game just a little bit, why that's important, okay? Net fill weight, uh, this is a very basic test. Why is it important? Why do you think net fill weight is such an important thing for a fill product? Outdoor gear, we like lighter weight. Right. Yeah, yes, yine. Um, <laughs> what? Or do you think? If, if on the jacket it says 500 grams of fill and there's only 450 grams, right? Number one, you're not meeting the specification that the brand requires, right? Number two, if you're producing 10,000 jackets, you're saving a lot of money by cutting 50 grams out of each jacket. So this is the number one, best way I can say, number one way for a supplier to save cost by putting a little bit less in than you required. So net fill weight is a very easy test. You rip out part of your jacket, take everything out, and weigh the before and after, right? But it's, it's the biggest problem that we have, and we test these daily for uh, big jacket producers all over the world because they have such a problem with people just putting a little bit less in. So is that the, so they come at North Face and they have a company that's doing it, so they're going to test, like what, what's the company that's producing their jackets, they're going to take their jackets back and say, they're test these, make sure this company is doing another thing? So for example, no. exactly, for example, North Face, they produce their jackets, a lot of the jackets from a company in Korea called Pan Pacific. Pan Pacific is the largest jacket producer in the world. They produce jackets for every Company, whether it's H&M, Gap, North Face, every large jacket uh, brand. Um, and when North Face gets their order, they will then pull samples to test. Okay. Right? And then they send them to you once you do that test. Policy. Exactly. They say, yeah, they're filling it, no, they're not. Exactly, they're right. short and stuff. And then they get into claims yeah. and ask for chargebacks and those type of things. So in, the, in the low end fashion, like Gap, H&M, Zara, which is we were here, you know, really bargain fashion. That's where you see the most issues on apparel mm -hmm. because they produce so much, so many jackets, right? Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of jackets a year, right? Uh, product construction. Any designers or hopeful designers in here? Okay. Uh, Product construction impacts down performance. The one thing that's missing is designers impact down performance, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so designers are the biggest challenge to down jackets, and I'll explain why in a sec. But we have fabric types, weight, design, density. All of these things affect uh, um, What is the buying decisions? In the fashion, how it looks, right? Oh, this is a cute jacket. Um, Warmth, right? if I'm looking for something warm. Fill proof, go to the next. Okay, there we go, there. Leakage, if you, go to, if you go find a jacket and you try it on at the store and you take it off and there's down everywhere, you're probably not gonna buy that jacket. My recommendation to you is, like some you're in Costco, go find one of their outdoor jackets, their lightweight down jackets. Put it on, walk around the store while you're shopping, take it off. You will have a lot of down on your clothes afterwards. <laughs> okay? But Costco is one of the biggest producers of outdoor apparel in the world. Okay? They have a lot of brands and they create a lot, a lot of down jackets like this. Okay? A lot of, uh, and a lot of where's the best? 
a lot of vests like this, and they're really cheap, 1999. Some of them are great, they look great, but you're gonna have a lot of fiber on yourself out there, okay? But, and this is the number one consumer return. I'm gonna return my sample, right? I don't like it, it? because I'm down in the road, okay? And so you have to test for it. You have to test for uh, downproof properties. Is, is my fabric downproof? So we're going to look at a few things here. What's the not, what do you think the number one step is to make sure my fabric is not leaking? Because you want to avoid, you want to avoid that this jacket is leaking. And you, did you all find some fibers on the jackets? Yes. Okay. That's what we want to avoid, right? All of these jackets were submitted to us because they wanted to check or they were concerned with the leakage issues, okay? So what should these companies have done? What should they have done? So for example- Your Contact test, where they sort of pushing and moving the- Push and moving, or there's a rotating box, but yes, pushing and moving the rubbing test. Where is a good one? Where is this? Anyone heard of Marco Polo? Yeah. Okay. There, Marco Polo's in, in Munich, Germany, just outside Munich, Germany. They produce a lot of product for Europe. Um, if this failed, and I'm pretty sure it did just by looking at it, um, what are they going to do with it? They have, let's say, 30,000 jackets in their warehouse, and it failed. What are they going to do? It's sell too late, them. right? They're going to sell them anyway. They're going to sell them anyway, yeah, absolutely, and they'll just pay people when they return them, right? So what should they have done first? They should have gotten it tested by you first, and one product or prototype, and in, before they put it into manufacturing. Test the individual components, right? Yeah. So that's what we're trying to get uh, companies to do is say, look, you got to test the fabric, right? So these are, one of these is an after wash five times, and one of them is before wash, and you can, you'll see it times five on one. This is a before wash and after wash. You can, Probably feel the difference, maybe not, on the fabric. Is this also before and after? This is synthetic. So, brands. This is synthetic, though, right? Yeah. So, the brands are realizing real quick that they need to rule out the fabric. They need to say, okay, is my fabric downproof or leak proof, right? There's no polyesters, there's no down coming from it. If that's the case, then I can move on to pre-production sample. This is where the designers come in. What's the most popular look for a down jacket? The number one selling down jacket in the world. It's the ghost hoodie. Which one from here? It's the mountain hardware. Yeah, this look, yeah, right? That. This look, right? Whoever designed this, the initial design, good for them. They've sold millions and millions of these, but these are the worst at leakage, okay? Um, because, because of the design. There are so many stitch lines, so many chambers, down will always find a way to get through it. Uh, you just do. Right? There's so many small fibers they get through versus a of course, no one wants to wear this around it, you know, in May when it's kind of hot, right? But there's, you're not gonna have a lot of leakage issues with this jacket, right? So that's the challenge. That is the challenge. So you have to test your components first. That's key. You know, if you're just creating a t-shirt, of course you have one component really, right? But if you're creating this, you have to test your fabric, you have to test your down separately and then the finished product. And so many companies, it's amazing the brands that don't do that and they just then test their finished product and wonder then there's nothing to do. And for the jacket like that though, if, if they're trying to combat the leakage issue, yep. they're in a factory taking out kind of like the skeleton of the feather, right? So they're removing those parts to try to prevent them from poking through? No, that's already pre-produced at the down processor. Okay. It's, that recipe is already determined. I want 90% down, goose down, and when it gets to the sewing factory, that's already packaged and ready to go. Okay. There's no issues there. 
Yeah. So you find that like the most common values are through seams, or is it seams. through back? Ninety percent of it seems. Yeah. Which seams? Under the armpits or the all those seams? All the stitches. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. So that's because you're puncturing the fabric with the needle, obviously, and that's where they're coming out of. Yeah, and 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 the the challenge is is finding the right needle size, thread size, the right combination. And you may create one and the 90% goose down is just fine. But then next year you're like, oh, I'm gonna save costs. I'm gonna reintroduce a 90% duck down. And then it all of a sudden fails, okay? So you also have to match the fill material. And we see the same thing for polyester fill, you know, anything like that. We're starting to see a lot of leakage from these products, even in polyester. Okay. How many of your clients are outdoor industry? Um, we test for most all of the outdoor industry. No Probably. So you don't have any competitors? Um, we have very little. In the U.S., there's only a, a one other lab that tests for down feather in the U.S. Where are they out of? They're in California. They're really small. So um, they just have like three employees, I think. They're really tiny. <laughs> in Europe, in, the, in Europe, it's just us. There's no other manager in Europe. In China, we have a lot. There's probably 30 other labs in China, but um, they're all government-owned testing labs, so no own trusts. How many samples do companies or clients send to you to test? I mean, I'm, actually, I'm sure it varies per client, but um, uh, let's see. Like for specifically for a talker? Oh, yeah. Give us an example. Job. Give us like a big con outdoor company that would send you, what would a typical sample they have said that they would send you? It's hard to tell how outdoor company because a lot of com a lot of brands just have it in their contracts. You need to test with IDFL so that their suppliers will send. But probably the, the largest ones will be testing maybe five to plus thousand tests a year. We test, we test probably um, 30, we probably get 30 plus thousand samples and that tra translates into about 140, 150,000 tests. It's good job, security. So, so have, did you, have you seen a, a change in your services since the last session? Does it, I'm testing with slow down that design process. So two things that help our uh, business is when products fail, they always come back to us. And when the economy takes a downturn, uh, what happens is, is fast fashion, for example, um, they of course want to save cost. And usually when cost saving comes around, whether it's that type of company or an econ economic, downturn, testing costs is the first that would be cut. Well, IDFL, see you later. And we, we're fine, we say, okay, that's great. We'll see you in six months. And in six months they come back and say, guys, all our stuff is failing, right? Okay? Because as soon as they cut off a third party tester, then all of a sudden you want to boost up, you have duck down, all these different things. So they, they usually come back, so we're not too worried about it. So, but fast fashion is the number one where they just try to embarrass yeah. So you started seeing more companies go towards like I've seen it in a couple of different mm -hmm. jackets, but they go to like welded seams. Yes. Like that jacket right there. Yeah. The yeah. Yep. There's a lot that are playing with that. Yeah. Of course, in the outdoor, yeah. the you know the H and M's and Zars of the world, they don't have the cost. You know, that's not in their cost plan to do go that route. And it's, what's interesting is even these welded seams, we see a lot of leakage, you know, and we don't know if it's, you know, the, the challenge, really, you know, is the lightweight fabric, right? This is such a cool looking fabric, but it leaks like crazy. Right? I still buy it. So, so. <laughs> I'll sell it to you yeah. today. How much? Cheap. <laughs> so, she would love that. So, um, so, like, for example, these blue pillows and these light blue pillows, I guess, yeah. they're all filled with the same fill. It's 90-10. But these blue fill pillows, because of the type of fabric that it is, fail. 
But these blue ones, these ones did really well, even now we wash the fabric. Those are synthetic though. No, they should be 9010. No, it's not. Yeah, it's 9010. Yeah. It's the same as that. Yeah. Exactly the same. But because of the fabric, the type of fabric, and the particles can escape here. So for you, for everyone that's wanting to produce a jacket or any type of fill, whether it's an outdoor sock, shoe, we see a lot of down and gloves. Um, we're seeing scarves with down, underwear, a lot of down underwear out there. I haven't tried it, but it could be nice. Um, these are the things you need to look at, right? And, and I'm happy to make this presentation available to you if you guys want to look at it but density is huge that creates so many problems if it's too filled or underfilled you may not get the look you want but you also may create a leakage issue um, construction we talked about that thread needle size stitches per inch stress points like you mentioned under you know you know right there you can have a lot of leakage issues depending on You know, all of these things, fabric, yarn, treatments. A lot of companies will, they won't test the fabric, but they'll treat it, they'll treat it with a chemical, right? Mm. And then so it's down for, then after, you know, six months it wears off and then it leaks, right? So you have to be aware of those types of things. Sorry, there's so many questions, but the mm -hmm. next, I'm like, looking in the future, who regulates like IDFL? Is there some worldwide regulator or you hit? Are you where the buck stops? Um, well, um, I'll, I'll touch on that because we're going to show you a list of all the um, country standards and those regulate it. There's specific labeling standards for each country okay. and specific test standards. So we just have to, we follow just, those standards. And we confirm to the client, does it meet the standard or not? Got it. So it's legislation yeah. is the backbone yeah. behind the And so the legislation is made based off of what we recommend usually. Yeah, there's there's no. <laughs> so <laughs> ethically, though, could a company technically bribe you, you know, and say, hey, give us no. good test standards? Or... That's why a lot of our competitors no longer test. Oh, because they do take bribes. So we take, we, you know, entertain that for one minute. Businesses over third-party testing, consulting—that's the—that's the, the you know, it's the end all right there. No, no kids. That's amazing. I will not sell you your jacket. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but anyways, uh, product specifications—it's so important for down, more so than a lot of other fill textile products because of the components. Did you find the down cluster? You think? think Did you guys find the down cluster? We thought it was a sun. Oh, yeah, that's that's duck down cluster. Yeah, so this separated by species. So yeah, and these are really big. They're really big duck clusters. So did you find yours? Did you guys find yours? Uh, yeah, we. What do you? Uh, we'll keep looking. <laughs> I mean, what are you getting? So that's the cluster, obviously. Are you, are you having us pick it out of one? Pick it out because there's. Just, like there's feathers, the there's, there's feathers, there's feathers, there's broken and damage, there's yeah. residue, which is probably skin and a little bit of beak and all sorts of stuff in there. So we found one, I just found one on one of the jackets. Yep, yeah, exactly. This one and that one in there. First is which one is just? Oh, yeah, these are like feathers. Oh, that's what it feathers. So what's the benefit of putting feathers in there? So it's all about money, money, money. Got it. Right? If you no no supplier can afford to put one hundred percent down cluster, so and the laws don't require that, all right? So, for example, in Canada, if you want to label something ninety percent goose down, you only have to have sixty percent down cluster inside, mm -hmm. even though it's labeled ninety percent down cluster. Okay, so you have great margins if you're a producer. Right? So don't buy it. So. In Europe, if you're calling a product goose down, you only have to have 70% goose in the product. In Why? the US, if you're calling it goose down, you have to have 90%. So there's a lot of differences. So, and, um, but if I'm a consumer and I'm buying a down jacket that says 90% goose down, I assume it's goose down. I wouldn't think that a third of it is duck and that you know it's only 80% cluster. 
There's a lot of you know odd things like that. So, Are you guys testing emerging technologies other than down? Is there anything else that we're testing? Yeah. Yeah, we we're testing a lot of uh, other film materials, polyesters that are being produced, mixes of down that they're. You know, anything that they're trying to do to put in the products. Is there anything that's surprising you other than down? Um, the stuff that they try to get away with. <laughs> but um, a lot of the stuff, because they'll come to us and say, hey, this is a product idea. We'll run it through some tests. But we're usually on the front as far as the new stuff that's coming out, just because they want to see how it interacts with the products. But the most common thing is blended. 40% down, 60% polyester was blended together. It saves me money, I don't have to pay all down, but I may have a similar uh, comfort level for the consumer. So let's, we're gonna spend five minutes on the supply chain, okay? Any questions about animal husbandry or ethical sourcing, let's save till the end, um, because the discussion of live plucking will end up being a two hour discussion. So I'll, we'll touch on this at the very end, okay? Um, okay, so down traceability. I know when Matt asked how many of you guys own like a down product, almost all of you raised your hands. Um, and I don't know if any of you have ever really thought about these questions, you know, where did the down, besides knowing that it is down feathers, um, where it came from, how it's collected, um, and if there's you know any animal lovers out there wondering how the birds live um, and were treated, uh, and how the the material is manufactured and the cleanliness and everything like that. Um, have any of you ever thought about stuff like that when you yeah. say, "Oh, here's my down jacket," yeah. like thinking about these questions? So that's clear. But. So there's two industries. There's the meat industry and the down industry. The down is strictly a byproduct of the bird. So nobody really cares about the down. Everybody just wants the bird meat. Um, so what we're analyzing is the goose down and then the duck down. Um, That's what we're tracing, right? Yeah. We're not tracing the bird when we're doing supply chain, supply chain mapping, yeah. traceability for for companies, whether it's Patagonia or um, Arcteryx or Canada Goose, we're tracing that. So we're not going and saying, okay, bird, where are you from, et cetera. But I'm gonna pass these out while Meek's talking and you guys can open it up, get your hands in there, so, take some out. Uh, there's it's usually two types of farms that we We'll audit. There's going to be this big on here, right? The big industrial farms, and so those are where there's hundreds of thousands of birds, just you know, all strictly for the meat industry. So all of those are really well documented because it is the meat industry. And then on the left, you're going to have your small family farms. Um, I've have you guys heard of the Hutterite colonies in? Canada, or there's even some here in the United States, like more in the Midwest area. So I had the opportunity to work with a company in Canada who has very strong relationships with the Hutterite colonies um, in Canada, and we will go and audit those um, farms who they collect the down from, um, and then the family or colony will keep the bird as for their winter um, beasts, I guess. Um, but the company that I work with sells all of their material to Canada kind of Goose. Um, so, is it possible to trace and evaluate a down supply chain? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, here's how the down is processed um, it'll arrive to the processing plant from the. Um, it, it shows up in, you know, just nasty feathers and down um, and then it will be sorted through uh, this machine at the bottom and then the next side will kind of show you how but um, so that would be the process of how everything is kind of sterilized and cleaned 
Um, the sorting machines are pretty cool. They're really big with separate chambers in them, and each chamber will have a different airflow. So when you dump all of your feathers inside, according to each chamber, the lighter stuff will float over the chamber into the next. So at the end, you're going to be left with all of your high end down, like your really nice clusters. And that's where the outdoor industry, they're, they're looking at chamber five, right? Yeah. All, all your outdoor brands. They're not really interested in chamber one or two, which is the big feathers. They don't, they don't really use for that. Like the big so. quills and everything like that. Um, this is how the down is stored at the processor. So these bags, they probably contain just like 20 to 25 kilos. Mm -hmm. um, they're huge. So that kind of gives you a sign of how much material does come in and is processed um, by these processors. I think this one is in China. That's in China. But the ones in the States and uh, Canada look just like this. Um, this is a big blending machine. So if you have a high percentage of down cluster and your client requests for it to be 75, 25, you'll put the correct mixture in here and it'll blend it all together. And then you'll be able to sew it out. Um, this is an example of Think in China of a manufacturing plant uh, of just bedding. Jackets. Um, so as far as the supply chain goes, there's really a low risk supply chain and a high risk supply chain. And what that means is when it comes to a low risk supply chain, it's all fully integrated. So there's a company here in the States called Maple Leaf Farms. I don't know if maybe you've heard of them. They uh, are the biggest um, duck meat producer in North Ern. North America. North America is a bigger mm -hmm. people. Um, so I went and audited them, uh, and it took about a week. Uh, but we, I got to see from here. You can take a handful of down and trace it all the way back to the breeder farm. So they'll start from the breeder farm, go to the hatchery, go to a raising farm. Um, and from there, depending on what grade of meat they want, it will be slaughtered at a certain age um, or move on to, or they'll just uh, keep them and then rebreed them. Um, the higher risk supply chain, so all these yellow portions, there's just so many, so many things that could get mixed up. So from the left side, you have three things from the retailer, but on the far right, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different, I guess, cogs in the wheel to get you your um, product. Um, so what I do when I go audit is every time the material changes, um, I guess levels, I will, that's where the, how you um, are able to trace and verify all the information coming from the farmer level all the way up to the retail level. So these level, so these verification points is where I go um, in North America to um, check out the supply chain. Here's an example. Um, this one's pretty simple. You have your retail store and then their manufacturer slash processor who makes all the jackets for that retail store. And so they're gonna have all these different processors around Europe who get their material from slaughterhouses in Europe. Um, so these ones are pretty easy to trace, um, but when it, comes to like this, this is only eight of 15 um, sources. So here you have, you have one in source six, you have one slaughterhouse that 
um, has 4,500 farms that it slaughters its down from. And then Matt was saying, as far as the rush, the Russia goes, hmm. the Russia is not. So Russia number eight. This is where it gets really risky because if they're unwilling to provide you information, then you can't really do anything about it. That it would be a lot more difficult than the um, 4,500 farms, which is doable. It would take a long time, but you would get a you know a general grasp of what you're looking for. But when it comes to uh, Russia. Um, and that's usually the case. They usually are always unwilling to provide information. Yeah. So then, it, as a brand, you even have to decide: do you accept do you want it their, right? you know, their internal statement that it's ethical down or not? So there's not much that can be done. But, so that's always a risk. That you know, most of the times the brands will move on to a different supplier. It's really the only choice nowadays. Okay. And so just to remind, like, for us as IDFL, this is what we're tracing. We're tr tracing the down clusters versus the, the new. So did you guys want my quick thing about live blocking? Yes. OK. <laughs> OK. Oops. Depends how many questions I get from this. I think it's skills. Okay, here we go. Live plucking. Illegal, it's bad for the birds, condemned, etc. Um, Ten years ago, there was never a question about live plucking. There was no supply chain audits being done in the down and feather industry. It wasn't an issue. The consumers didn't ask for it. Brands didn't ask for it, it's just the way it was. Uh, and the reason is because down is a byproduct of the meat industry. The amount of meat that's produced every year more than exceeds the amount of down and feathers that are produced at the down processing plants. And everything's traceable to the slaughterhouses, okay? Um, of course, in every industry, it doesn't matter what's being produced, there are a few bad apples that will try and make a quick buck, okay? Same thing with the down and feather industry. Um, in Eastern Europe, you know, a few, uh, particularly in Hungary, Romania, um, those those couple countries, um, there's still a lot of gypsy colonies, and they'd be paid to go and do, you know, do some quick uh, harvesting of the down and feathers, and they'd make a you know a quick quick dollar. Um, the meat industry has zero interest in this. They own all the birds. They have zero interest because they're protecting the meat. Anytime you remove feathers, as you can imagine, from uh, a live bird, there's going to be scarring, etc. Right? So it's not done. There are no birds in the world that are raised for the down of feather. It's not cost. You know, you can't make any money doing that. All the money is in the meat. The, the slaughterhouses sell the meat, sell the down feather. It's like a percent of a percent of their turnover um, for the slaughterhouses. If the down feather did not buy it or take it off their hands, they would just be thrown away in landfills. There's no value to it to the meat industry. Okay. So, but what happened was today in today's world, social media, YouTube, all of a sudden, a few pictures went around, and then. 80% of the down and feather industry is being live plucked, right? And so we went, we went with a lot of other agencies and we audited basically what seemed like the entire down and feather industry worldwide. And we confirmed that, that, yeah, there are a few instances. We've done thousands of audits. We've come across one or two maps and it was unbeknownst to the uh, slaughterhouse that owned the farms that it was happening, right? So it is a, really in our opinion a non-issue but the way the world works media can make it a big issue real quick um, so that's that's the thing on, on live plucking but now our business has boomed because of traceability audit requests makes doing 
audits from responsible down standard that was created by North Face, and we do those worldwide um, to confirm that this isn't happening. But in reality, it, the facts are this is a really a B2B issue, and there was no live plug material going into the marketplace. It was just a created thing, and now all of your jackets that you buy cost more because of it, because all the costs for the audits are deferred to the consumer. So that's the reality of it. So, so but it is, whoever does it, it's a terrible thing. So, but, uh, that's, okay, Skittles. Okay, question, what, what's the best quality jacket that you looked at? What do you think? There's well, gotta be one. It down, you're just pruning it down. No, or just the whole, the whole thing. Oh, the, this, the, this. Mountain <laughs> the mountain equipment or the Canada. Mountain equipment? Yeah, can you take one? Round of vote for mount equipment. Yeah. That or that. Round of vote for yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you got here. <laughs> Any other votes? No? Yeah. Who wants mount equipment? Yeah. Are you just like overall price of the jacket? Or Whatever you think. Quality. Just the best. Yeah. What about this one? Yeah. No? Always. No. What do you call it? Yeah. No. So, <laughs> Ab Abercrombie? I'll still take no. off for this. No. <laughs> These two. So how many want this one to be the best? Yeah, it's this one. Okay. And this one? Second bench. Yeah. Who voted this one? You did right? Mission. I mean stick with it. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um what's in this? Did you guys look? No, I couldn't find it. Yes. There's duck. You're right. Canada goose. Yeah. Canada goose has the has the yes. Eighty percent duck, right? Canada goose has the best name in the industry. Canada goose, and ninety percent of their jackets are full of duck. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but the label says duck. But no one ever looks at the label. I have a Canada goose jacket. I have a goose down jacket. It's all Chinese duck. So. Okay, anyways. So we're going to test. We're going to test these Canada goose and the Marco and the mountain equipment, okay? They're all the same. They're consumer now, aren't you? are. Oh, you already passed them out. Oh, sorry. Okay. You don't open them. <laughs> oh, Easy. Who's open up an eight? Did anyone eat, <laughs> open up? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you, you're pissed out. I'm, I'm out. I sit out. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, oh, you already opened up. Don't okay, we gotta do one again. Don't hate me. That's okay. Oh, no. This is this is your test sample. You go out. Okay, this is a jacket. Pretend this is a jacket. The paper is your fabric. Inside is the down. What's the most valuable component in the down cluster? Down cluster. The yellow, the yellow Skittles are the down cluster, okay? We're gonna do a net fill. What I need you to do is open your down jacket and count, do not eat, but count all of your down clusters, okay? Pour them out, do a separation by color, okay? Just because you don't have all all yellow doesn't mean you lose. That's zero. So just <laughs> separate them out. Oh, that's zero. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, see. Yeah. You have a really good separation. Really good. Yeah. That's a good one. Okay. Okay. So now we're talking about testing variants. Okay. So. <laughs> Okay. Who has zero down clusters? <laughs> <laughs> you got the Abercrombie. I got the Okay. Who has one down cluster? You have one? You have one. So two. Who has three? One, two, three, four. 
Five. Okay, who has holy? Wait. Who had two? I don't think we go fast. We skipped two. Did I skip two? No. Oh, anyone have two? One. One, okay. And then, then five. five. And then four. Who has four? One, nice. two, three, four, five. Okay. And who has five? Wow. One. Anyone have six? Jeez. Anyone have more than six? Did you give them? Oh, okay. Okay. So the average is. What's the average? Two point nine three. Okay. So, who has the correct jacket? Who, who has the best quality jacket? Five. You're the highest. Okay. What do you guys think? So, this is the problem with down testing, okay? This is the problem. Every time, and the Skittles is perfect because we can do this with 10 people. We can do this with 500 people. Every time the average is between 2.5 and 3.5 of yellow Skittles in packs, okay? That's their spec, is to have that on average. But in each case, it's completely different, right? So you had zero. If I tested your jacket, then we would have said you failed. You're out. You know, we're not going to use you as a supplier anymore, right? If I tested you, I would have questioned. I said, how can you be producing it? such a good product? I only wanted three. You must be doing something under the table, right? Um, <laughs> all of you that had two to three, we'd be like, you're right on, right? But this is the risk, and this is what we see all the time, whether it's outdoor bedding, when we're testing, is companies relying on a single jacket, and all of these, unfortunately, fall into this case. I'm gonna send in one jacket, it passes, okay, let's sell all 50,000 jackets, right? Mm -hmm. Huge mistake. This happens all the time. So is that a lot of time because companies aren't gonna order five prototypes yep. from a factory, so they're only getting one. So is that what the issue is? The issue is they're not pulling products from the initial first run of production. Okay. That's the issue. Okay. They test a prototype, and what happens with the prototype? Yes, the supplier to do a prototype. It's a Sunday sample. It is beautiful, right? The, sun, the prototype, it, there's not an issue wrong with it. Mass production, quality goes down just a little, right? But it, in your case, a lot, right? Yeah, it's not yeah. having yeah. 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 um, so, so that this is the challenge. And, uh, and I'm gonna show you an example of, we got just a, two minutes, right? Yeah. Now I'm gonna show you an example of a company that you probably have all heard of that solved this problem. Okay, and this is this is my recommendation to you when looking at the testing is you need to not rely on a single value, a single result, a single test, just relying on that fabric. You have to have a lot of tests, a lot of information so that you can make the best judgment. Because there is not it's not an exact science. And particularly when you introduce film material, you're gonna be all over the board. So would you okay. suggest to a company, hey, provide us five random samples or yeah we we always say of course it, it all comes to cost right but we always say minimum uh, you have a pamphlet I min, you sent out. yeah we is it minimum five or four minimum five samples so you can get an average right so but question while we're while i'm jumping to this what is quality though when, from a testing perspective, what is quality? It what you define it as. So what, how do you think as a testing, if you're testing for, if you're working in-house testing for Patagonia, how should you define quality? The highest? Oh, this is the most cluster. That's the best quality? Um, is that how you should define it? No. How? Consistent. Whatever meets your, your consumer's goals. Product specification, compliance. Compliance is quality. That's it. Production-wise, it's all compliance, right? So you may you may have an 89% down cluster that's supposed to be 90. That's a really good quality. 
But if I'm spending 20% down cluster and it's 22 coming in, that's a much better quality product than the 89. And that's how you have to view quality when it comes to testing and labeling. Okay? So this is what happens in testing. And this is how a company, if you all have heard of IKEA before, <laughs> they solve the problem for themselves. And they produce a lot of low cost products, right? Um, but we see this all the time. We test, two, percent, two tests, different variation, but the average is 80%. Okay. We test three times, it's above 80, it's supposed to be 80, good. Maybe another case we test three times, two of them are below, according to the FTC it fails. They'll pull your products off the shelf in a heartbeat, right? Even though it's only 33%, right? Uh, I mean 0.33%. Four tests, then we get to 50, right? This is 50 tests of the exact same product. Look at the variation. So the industry standard for fill testing is plus or minus 3%. That's expected testing variance. So these on the outliers will dismiss and we'll say, okay, all of these that it actually meets the average is, is correct, right? So you can feel comfortable with your product. But the challenge is, is if the government pulls a single product and tests it on the low end, there's a problem. IKEA shifted it and they said our minimum requirement is 82% on an 80% product. We are demanding you do 2% more. It shifted the entire bell curve and their failure rates went next to them. On, and they have, they have the problem of the highest price points that suppliers have to meet. Is that because only because of that? Oh, yeah. shifted 2%. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was amazing what they did just for that. Could probably more to it though, right? Inspection. No, they just moved that. The product being put in was a well higher cluster, shifted the whole thing. Wow. They didn't change anything else. So, so they just relayed that to their supplier. Put it in the contract. We need two percent. Before their specs said eighty percent, now it says eighty-two. Even though their label stayed at eighty, right. they just created a buffer, and that solves the problem, the dilemma for them. Is anyone else doing that? Picking that up? There's a few. Um, so higher end outdoor, higher end fashion like Montclair and stuff like that, where you're paying you know seven thousand euros for a jacket, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's the cost. It's expensive, you know, adding two percent. So uh, um, I know you all have to go, but this is our final offer to you. You get a free pillow if you want to take a picture. That's your virtual voucher. <laughs> if you don't take a picture. If you come by our lab, That's you're more than welcome. Put me in there. <laughs> um, uh, come by this year. You're more than welcome to come by. You can run through fabric tests with us, downproof testing, check out all the jackets, and we'll give you a tour. You can do some tests. If you come by and visit us, you get a free pillow set. We always have the more responsive pillows that we give out. So just take the picture, email me and uh, set up a time, you're all more than welcome to come down to Salt Lake. Thank you. Good? Thank you. Sorry, that was a lot of information in a short time, but thank you. Down in Feather now. If I'm a startup company, how much would it cost generally if you guys provide clothes? Is your startup? Startup company making down jackets or sleeping bags. Ooh. It's probably too expensive for me. If you want to test, yeah. You guys, um, take these, if you were going to bring them, just give them on the card. But take these, if you bring them, we can do a lot. The core testing is pretty good. First of all, I'll give you the old. Oh, you should have all of them. Yeah, don't worry about that, just go for a second. Thank you.